number of years ago when I first became involved in instruction for fast pitch softball, I had the impression, like many people do, that the game is dominated by tremendous pitching. And while there are a number of excellent pitchers in the game of fast pitch softball, I found it to be true what a wise lady told me as I began that instructional journey. She said, fast pitch softball is not dominated by great pitching, it's dominated by bad hitting. I found that to be quite true over the years, that while the pitching is good, in many situations the hitting is the problem, not the fact that the pitching is so outstanding. And so what we want to look at today is ways to improve the hitting in fast pitch softball from the mental perspective. Because as I began to develop an instructional process for fast pitch hitting, I came to looking at the steps that really happen in fast pitch softball, or in baseball or slow pitch softball for that matter, and there are basically five stages. The first is that the hitter collects visual information. A pitcher throws the ball and the hitter tries to see just what the ball's doing. With their eyes, they collect the visual information, pitch data if you want to call it that. The hitter then analyzes that information. They figure out what their eyes have seen. They process the information. After that, a decision is made. Do I swing or do I stop the swing? And if I'm going to swing, where do I swing? When do I swing? And maybe how do I swing? So you're collecting information, you're analyzing that information, and then you're making a decision about that information. Only after those three mental and visual stages comes the action. The action of physically swinging the bat and attacking the ball. And after all of that is over, the hitter should learn. So my formula, my word, if you want to call it that, is cattle. Now, it's not spelled like the plural of cow, C-A-T-T-L-E, it's spelled C-A-D-A-L. So what hitting really boils down to is collecting visual information, analyzing that information, deciding what to do with that information, acting upon that information, and when it's all over, learning from it. That's the core from which we'll develop this video today. I'd like to look at some principles that will help us and then as we get farther into it, we'll take that trip from the team bus to the batter's box and show you all the stages along the way and mental skills and drills that hitters can use. The first principle I'd like for you to explore is an equation called A equals S minus I. Basically what we're trying to do as instructors or as hitters is increase the odds of success, increase the odds of achieving success at the plate. The equation A equals S minus I actually came from a book on golf that I read one time, and it said achievement equals skill minus interference. So our job is to increase our skills, whether they be mental, visual, or physical, and to decrease the interference. What we're trying to do is decrease that interference so the skills can flow, basically. We gotta let the interference go so the skill can flow. By doing that, we increase the achievement. Oftentimes, coaches spend all their time working on the physical skills, but we don't deal with the things that interfere with that skill. We've got to do both, and we've got to deal with mental, visual, and physical to develop the complete hitter. One way to do this is what I call the four twos. The hitter has to want to. Then the hitter has to believe that she is able to or going to. She then has to learn how to. And eventually, she has to practice so that her body is able to do what her brain knows about. So you've got to want to, believe you're going to, learn how to, and practice so that you're able to. Many times we know the information in our brains, we say we know how to hit, we know how to use our mental skills, we know how to see the ball better, but we don't practice enough so that we're able to do those kind of things. So we've got to decrease that interference, we've got to increase those skills, and using those four twos will allow that to happen. Now what's nice is that a small change in the level of the skill or the interference can lead to a fairly substantial change in achievement and actually an enormous change in the results that you get from the actions at the plate. So we're going to work on increasing those mental skills, we're going to work on decreasing what interferes, which is often mental skills, things like fear, mental problems of fear and frustration could be a physical problem like fatigue, could be stress, could be tension. These are game-like situations that we have to learn to control as a hitter. Now, I mentioned the word control. One of the things we want to do as a hitter or as an instructor is have our players learn what they can control and what they cannot control, the things that they have an impact on. We might say we want them to learn to control the controllables. 
So a good drill is for hitters just to sit down with a piece of paper or in small groups and talk to one another. You might even have a group that's called the control group and a group that's called the uncontrollable group. You may have some uncontrollable players, but that's not quite what we're talking about. You're looking at things that you can control at the plate. You can control your view of the ball. You can control your thoughts. You control your mental approach to hitting. You can control where you take the stance. You can control whether you attack the ball or you're a defensive hitter. You control your effort. You can control your attitude. But there are things you can't control. You can't control the weather. You can't control what the umpire calls. You can't control what the pitcher throws. You can have an impact on that. You may can influence it, but you can't control those things. You can't control the result of the batted ball. Once you've hit the ball, the defensive players have control of what happens to it in many cases. Sometimes the dirt and the grass or the wind has control of what happens to the ball. So we've got to look at what you can control and what you can't control. I remember back in 1998, I believe it was, the University of Arizona in postseason play scored something like 48 runs. They made no errors, and they gave up only one run. That's in the regionals and in the College World Series. They scored 48 to their opponents one and made no errors, and they came in second in the nation. The one run they yielded was in the finals of the College World Series. They can't control the outcome of everything. An enormous journey they took in postseason play, dominating the teams, but they still came in second in the College World Series. Let's look as now we'll advance from the team bus to the batter's box and we'll work on those mental skills and drills that we've alluded to.